What a beautiful place we are all in. It's a real blessing of Sahaja Yoga. For all of you to relax. Relax well. <clears throat> because in relaxation only you realize that we are now realized souls that <clears throat> we have entered into the kingdom of heaven. That we can see the beauty what God has created around us. That we have become sensitive to his grace and to his kindness and to his love. It's a seminar that you have arranged and I'm very happy. I always wanted you to arrange seminars and that you all should meet together and live together and understand each other. <clears throat> the seminars on the gross level, they work out many things, no doubt. But on subtler levels, seminars of the Sahaja means means a lot. It uh, means that a strong nucleus is being consolidated in various places in a country. And these strongholds, or we can say the strong nucleus, which is created like this, <clears throat> can form a mechanism by which beams of strong vibrations could flow or could be thrown all over the places. It's a very great task to build up these mechanisms, these divine mechanisms in different parts of your family. Let's take it out for a while. For example, Mother Earth has done her job. Wherever it was possible for her, she has created living deities to show that God exists, that you can now test their vibrations and see for yourself how she has worked very hard. She has created all this beautiful universe. He has created you also. He has created the Kundalini within you. She represents the beautiful nature we can see. In her company, in her bounties, when you are drenched and you all meet each other, you see for yourself that how she blesses all of you just the same. There is no difference between you and any other person for her. But those who are sensitive or subtler people enjoy her much more than you people. Because now the problem that exists in every country has its own style, I have seen. And as in this country also, we have a style of problems, which comes. Uh, gradually, it's changing its form. In the beginning, I found that people were over-aggressive, skeptical, and also could be rude also sometimes. <clears throat> it's all right. Makes no difference to me. Now, gradually, they started changing over. <clears throat> now, they are becoming aware of what they have got, what role they are playing, how important it is to be an Englishman, 
I mean, I say English, I mean all the English people, not Wales or anything different. And how they have to become part and parcel of the heart of the universe. <clears throat> I wonder how many of you really realize how important it is to be an Englishman. That everything that happens in this country circulates. For example, if this royal wedding had taken place in any other royal family, it would not have circulated so much. Everything circulates from this country. Maybe you may not think much of yourself. You may think that what is so great, after all, is England is like any other country. But you see why people accept so many things from you, like even a monarch. I mean, most of the countries have thrown away their monarchies. And uh, in this country, it exists and it has a respectable position. And the symbol of a monarchy is still lingering here in a very proud way. Then the marriages. The marriages of royal families are already detested and protested and nobody is interested. And such an auspicious thing should take place here and that everybody should see it. So many countries should watch it and appreciate it and enjoy it of all the things. Is something surprising. It, is, it transcends all rationality, all understanding of uh, even logic, we can say that. What is the logic behind it? But if you are enjoying it, you just enjoy it. You don't want to think about it while you are enjoying it. So one has to understand that you are part and parcel of the heart of the universe. One thing is essential that you have to be very flexible people. You have to have the flexibility of the heart cells, we can see. Now, heart has to pump. It has to be strong. And surprisingly, lion is your emblem. So you have to have a lion's heart. And lion's heart means he's not afraid. He's the king. He knows he's the king and he lives like a king. Like a lion. And Leo, as in astro uh, astrology, or if you say, is a man who's extremely generous. Lion hearted, not afraid of him. There should be no fear. But English language, if you read anyone, or if you listen to anyone, every third sentence will come with the word, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to say, I'm afraid this is so. This word must be dropped out from the vocabulary of Sir Yogis. What is there to be afraid of? Some people say that this is said because we do not want to hurt other people. There are so many other ways of saying things without hurting others. But what is there to be afraid of? A man who is weak cannot love. Only a strong person can love. If you talk of love, first of all, see whether you are strong enough to love or not. Loving is not an easy thing. Even carnal love, even loving your beloved of in the ordinary sense, is not an easy thing. You have to have a very strong moral concept. Otherwise, every third minute, people start changing their loves. That kind of a love has no meaning. You have to have a very firm ideas. Not only ideas in your brain, but built within it. Very few people can really have a love as Romeo had, I can tell you. It's easy to think that you're a Romeo. It's different. 
You can think you are you are the king of king of England. It's all right, but you don't become that way. So, to be Romeo itself, you have to have a tremendous character, a tremendous sense of sacrifice and love, and understanding of what you want. You want to love. That's all. Nothing beyond or before. I mean, a man, when he falls in love, he falls in love forever and ever and ever. If he falls in love many a times, it cannot be love. So that experience also is sort of is a forbidden fruit. For most of So to love God is even more difficult. <coughs> without seeing him, without knowing him, without knowing his bounties, without getting realization, it is very difficult. But today that is not the case. But still you have to have No fear in your mind. Trust. You trust yourself and trust others. First of all, try to trust yourself. If you have made mistakes, you have to say, yes, I have made mistakes. All right. So what? Trust yourself that you can correct yourself. Also. Trusting doesn't mean why blind ego trip. It does not mean that. Trust means that, yes, I can correct myself. I can improve. I can do better. Some people think that if you trust yourself, then you should never confess anything that you have done. That you should never say that it was wrong and I can correct. This is a wrong idea. You have to trust yourself by saying, that yes, I have done mistakes, I have been doing wrong, I have been faltering, but I can correct. I have that strength within me. I... Shri It's a lovely talk of uh, Shri Mataji in this seminar in the heart of the universe uh, in August uh, in Dorset that we listened to just now. And we have Felicity, uh, Felicity Payman joining us again today. Thank you, Felicity. And um, she's going to tell us the story behind organizing the seminar. And the interesting thing is the marriage that Shrimataji talks about is the marriage of the current king of England, uh, his first marriage, Charles, uh, with Diana. And the whole story is linked to um, this seminar and how it came about. So I'm going to request Felicity, thank you for joining us. Would you please uh, recount for us those days with Shrimataji? So thank you. Thank you for having me um, for a short session this time. <laughs> so we haven't we hadn't had it was August 1981. And we had had uh, seminars in England the previous year. We hadn't had one for a while. And it always had such a strong beneficial effect on the collective. And I had a strong desire to uh, help uh, organize another one. And when I first got realization, my parents had a, um, a, a second home in the countryside in Dorset, an old farmhouse that they had been renovating. And suddenly, and I had thought when I first got realization, what a wonderful place this would be to have a seminar. 
it's in the countryside and has a lot of space around it. But nothing had come about. And then suddenly I heard my parents were going away for two weeks in August and the big, large old mill room was completely empty of furniture except for the grand piano. And I felt this is our chance. This is our chance. We'll never have this chance again. There's actually space to have everybody there. And so I, um, so I asked them if I could, I, I, they were not positive towards Sajoga. So there was no way that they would agree for me to have um, organize a proper seminar there. And I was very unsure how, how can I, how can we make this happen? And then after um, a strong meditation, very thoughtless, I really felt inside, it's okay, we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll do this. And I, as a preparation, I asked them while they were away, if it would be possible to go down with just a few friends and stay for the weekend, which they agreed to. So this gave me the green light to kind of go ahead. And <clears throat> so we, shared this with the collective one of the yogis said he would come down and cook for everyone which was amazing because we would be doing it self-catering this time and then uh, I was reminded that it was auspicious to give a proper invitation to Shumataji to come for the weekend and if it would be if we could have a puja with her so this was must have been told to me quite close to the date that we had that we had available and i realized the only day that i could go to give this invitation would be the day of princess diana and charles's wedding so i felt like oh i would like to see that but it doesn't matter this is the day i'm working all the rest of the time i have to go so i wrote out a simple invitation inviting Shumataji and got on the train and went to her flat in London. So Shumataji lived in Victoria in Ashley Gardens in a large flat and the position of this place was very close to Buckingham Palace. It's very central to the government buildings and it's it's literally five ten minutes walk to Buckingham Palace. And as I'm walking through the streets to mother's place, they're absolutely deserted. I'd never seen the streets so empty. And I realized, oh, everybody's either at the palace watching, um, watching the procession or they're at home watching on the TV. And so I arrived at mother's, um, at Ashley Gardens and I was feeling very nervous um, to, um, approach you know to approach Shumataji in this way and we are I arrived and there was a another yogi at the waiting to get and the lift at the same time so so auspicious so I said oh you could give mother the invitation and he said no 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 you should do it so I went okay okay but it was good he was there so we went up in the lift together and he knocked on mother's door and this photo is actually Shumataji opening the door to her her flat in Ashley Gardens. And this is what we saw. Mother came to the door, she opened the door. And um, and I said, oh, I've, I've come to give you this invitation, Shumadachi. And she said, oh, yes, yes, come in, come in. We're watching the wedding. Come in, come in. And so she invited us. We both went in um, and sat down. And there in the living room, she and Sir CP were sitting in, on the sofa facing the TV. And the, the process, the, service was actually in um in process in Westminster Abbey where where Diana and Charles were getting married and uh, so I sat on the floor beside and continued to in, to join them in watching the wedding and after a few minutes in she Diana made some little mistake some error and she might she kind of um, looked at Charles and tut tutted that he was reacting to her making a mistake. And then a few minutes later, he made a mistake. And Shumadji went, yes, that's better now, you know? So it was amazing that she was she was watching. And recently I was reading an, um, a memory of 
what Shmanaji had said, and she actually had said that whatever, if she watches something, all the people who are watching that event, she can work through. Her vibrations spread through them. Uh, so she's watching Charles and Diana. Everyone else who was watching Charles and Diana on the wedding, Shumadaji's vibrations were passing through. She connected to everybody. I thought that was just incredible how the power of the divine, the power of her and her, her total... Um, understanding, you know, of course, but understanding the process, how to reach people in such a big way. And it was the biggest wedding attended and, and watched. Princess Anne had been married the year before and there had not been the same crowds or interest at all. But Shumadachi had said that Diana was a realized soul and she opened everybody's hearts and that's why everybody loved her. And she just had that magnetism and humility that drew everyone to her. So this was um, this was a lovely little bonus that I got to sit and watch. And then when it was finished, then I took my leave and it was very special. And then the following weekend, uh, we all went uh, down. Did you, did you, sorry, did you write a, a, an invitation card or did you just sort of verbally invite no, no, Shumatji? No, no, it was Please. proper. It was properly written, properly, you know, um, addressing her as the goddess and inviting with humility if she would care to grace us with her presence. Yes. We would be much appreciated if she would come um, to the seminar that was being arranged. And in the in the invitation, I had asked, because I noticed that every time when we had had seminars in the previous years, and big puja, the seminars particularly, people got a chance to really clear out in a very deep way. And you could feel everybody's hearts open and there was this great joy in the collective and being together. And then everyone would go back to London, back to their own homes. And gradually, you know, over a very short period of time, the heart would just close over again. And so I desired, I um, asked if she could talk about, make the focus of the seminar keeping your heart open uh, and she then um said you know open how to open your heart uh, yes. which, was, which was yeah because it just felt you know when the heart is open you just so much works out as shwaraji then talked about yeah. in her yeah the mechanism that shwaraji was talking about in that excerpt that uh of the talk she gave on that seminar and the importance of it all as time goes by, uh, essentially for Sahaja Yogis to come together and actually relax and, and go deeper um, together. You, so that was... And you really felt that with this seminar. Um, we were, you know, everyone, most people took trains, they didn't have cars and we were right in the depth of the countryside. Maybe we could just show the photos of Mill Farm, so people get a sense of where we were and what it felt like. And so, so this is um, was an old building, the site of which was in the Doomsday Book, and it had been originally a proper mill with a mill wheel and the water running under it. And the room that we had the puja in had been um, had had all the flour sacks coming down for the grain to be ground. And so here you can see in just down this, there you can see. So that's the farm buildings you, in the midst of this glorious countryside. Just, it, and that's it, it's just green field. We were, at, it's at the end of a village. Just stop a minute. Yeah, it's at the end of a village uh, across a railway track. It's sort of a dead end. So it's very silent and it was just a small village. And you can see straight ahead um, behind the ivy on the second floor between the, the window on the far right, that's the room. That, yes, that's the mill room. And it extends right, right down along that second floor to the corner, to the drain pipe. And that's where the puja was held. Wow. So. So this is the back garden and Shumataji after the puja, Shumataji came out and sat um, in that little courtyard in front of the greenhouse and 
uh, had tea and all the yogis just laid on the grass. We were just so relaxed. It was just so relaxed and enjoying. And if you go to the next photo, you can see looking up the garden. Yeah, so it stretched up the garden there and there's the flower beds. And it looked like that. It was a perfectly beautiful, warm, sunny August weekend. And actually we had tents in the garden. There wasn't so much space in the house. So people brought tents, camped in the garden. We had uh, two toilets, one bathroom and 70 people. I counted at one point about 70 people came. Wow. So it was, I mean, if there was a big event, it wasn't everybody in the UK, but most of the collective were there and we prepared so on the mm -hmm. Saturday we um so Patricia was a musician and a pianist and one of the yoginis had written this beautiful song called Omar I Bow to Thee so Saturday we practiced singing this together with harmonies and we were prepared to um, welcome Shumataji with this song, I Vow to Thee, My Country, and also Jerusalem when she arrived. So on the Sunday morning, I went with somebody in a car um, to greet Shumataji at the station. And be being August, I had imagined that the garden would be full of flowers and I could collect a beautiful bouquet to offer Shumataji as she arrived at the station. And to my horror, when I went out in the morning, there was like one single very small rose and somehow nothing else in bloom. And I was wow. absolutely devastated because in those days, Sunday, everything was closed, no shops, nothing. And so I sort of scrabbled a little bit of foliage to go with this rose. And we got to the station and this was just preying on my mind. And I'd sort of been looking desperately all the way there, you know, um, to how to augment this miserable bouquet as far as I saw. And then we got to the station and they had a lot of these beautiful little yellow daisy weeds, what we tend to yes. think of weeds because they grow everywhere and growing along on the station. And I thought, okay, okay, here's something, here's something. And I started picking these and uh, station master's wife saw me and I said, oh, is it okay? And she went, yes, they're just weeds, they're just weeds, you know. So then the train pulled in and Shimadaji stepped down from the train and I had this, at this point, small bouquet of mostly like wildflowers to offer to her, which in my mind was nothing compared mm -hmm. to what, what I would have liked to have given her, you know, what, oh. what, what she deserved. But as always, loving and gracious, she took the flowers and smelled them and said, oh, what fragrance. And I told the little story and she said, even weeds, you know, have, and she, and this is mentioned in the talk and that's the background behind it, which was so sweet. She always responded to the love in your heart, you know? And when you were in mother's presence, it, I was thinking about this recently, it was quite incredible how you were so connected to her in, in a, in the house, you knew your attention was with her. You knew if you're in another room, you might be talking to someone, but you knew where she was. You always had your attention there. And her attention was also on all of us. So you felt this connection and you you felt her like, you know, she could read your she could read your mind, she could read your thoughts, and something that might come into your mind, she would then reference later in a talk or you know, in a personal comment. So there were no secrets, you know, Shumadaji <laughs> knows everything. So then, so then we got to the, uh, so then mother arrived and we were all waiting in the, in the living room. And as she came in um, through the door, I think she must've come in through the back because there were no stairs. And as she came in and she sat down in this chair here, you see, and we started to sing and that was recorded. And if you go to Amruta, you can hear the three songs that we sang. And I was re-listening recently and there was just so much heart and devotion 
in singing to her. You know, everyone had had a chance to relax the day before. Mm -hmm. And here's Shamaraji, she'd arrive for the puja. You know, the excitement that you feel that she's here, she's come, the joy that her presence brought when she arrived. You know, you just sort of melted away and we sang and it was just really special. And I remember we sang, I vow to thee my country and you just felt so much vibrations. It was such a, you know, this was her army that she was um, training up and gathering to, together to be the foundation stones to, from, you know, out of England, so many, so much spread out because she came and she settled there and 79, I came in and people gradually, more people, new seekers were joining us. And then we got into 1980 and she was spreading through Europe. And then 81, this is the end of 81. And mother that year had been to America and India and Australia. And here we were in the heart of the, of England so you know, just, singing. Singing. Yeah. This, this just for reference. Just for Just for reference's sake, so the seminar that we are that you're telling us about today happened on the second of August in 1981, and uh, the links uh, are all on Amrita. So, uh, for those of us who want to, can enjoy the music, the whole speech of Shramataji. We only listened to the first few minutes, really, and 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 so to enjoy it a lot much more with the background story. Um, so Felicity, inviting Srimata Ji to, to your parents' uh, farmhouse there, how did you prepare it for Srimata Ji's visit? Because the goddess herself was coming? Did you do I, things the, that you wanted to <laughs> I wish I could say I had done more. Um, a lot of attention was on just the logistics of organizing yes. enough food for everyone suddenly yes. seven people yeah. and we had put Shumadaji in the special um, big double room and in those days it later in later years uh, we understood much more about how to host mother and how to host the goddess in a proper way and later on um, we actually would have um, in Vancouver we had when Shumadaji, so later on, Shumadaji started to stay in hotels when we had seminars and pujas, or she would stay on the site in a separate place. Um, in these days, we, the ladies often slept with her in the bedroom because she stayed where she was being hosted. Um, yes. but in the hotels later on, we actually had complete furniture for her. So we had a bed, we had all the linen, the towels, the furnishings, paintings, so that when Shumadaji arrived in a hotel room, it had been transformed as soon as, you know, they would take the room a day beforehand so that they could literally transform it so that there was nothing that would disturb mother. There was nobody's vibrations from previously. And it was a very beautiful thing. You and would clear it out as well, yeah. like with the braided water and a dry and dunny and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. And I have to say that um, I did not know about, you know, we didn't, I did not know about those things. So other than making the room very clean and having lovely flowers everywhere. Um, and I'm sure somebody was cooking special food. Well, actually, having said that, in those days, we didn't have special food for Shumadaji. We, she ate what we ate but always a special plate was prepared for her and she ate first nobody ate before Shumadaji had been presented with her plate and she would then say oh no now now you will eat you know but she would have the plate first so there were a lot of little things protocol you know we that but we just didn't know you know it was not like growing up in India and certainly I'm you know I did not know myself. Um, so then Shumaraji arrived, we started the puja. Um, she gave this beautiful talk. And we actually, although you won't see this in the photos coming up, um, we actually had a green towel. Someone had bought a green towel to put under her feet, but 
in the photos, it looks different. And so we could show some of the puja photos now. She gave this beautiful talk and Linda, bless her, had brought, in those days, we didn't know about the importance of giving a sari at each puja. So that hadn't been prepared, but Linda brought this green organza material, which she laced with white lace and invited everyone, brothers and sisters to embroider uh, little flowers on this green organza. And it was given to Shamataji um, towards the end of the puja as a gift. And you'll see that she wears it as a shawl and she it felt, felt very symbolic as being, um, yes, here's mother, so beautiful. Absolutely. So she's been given the mirror. She would do her own yes. makeup. You know, she would touch up the makeup because she's decorating herself as the goddess for the puja. And um, I think we just go back a minute because that was yeah. a bit fast. So yeah. let's start from here. So, so this photo must have been taken after the puja because you can see that mother's hands have been decorated. Yes. Um, this, yeah. I think this was, yeah, so here she is, yeah. Doing her hair. I oh, love the look and the smile, Shumataji, my God. And look, she's wearing a white sari too, which yeah. is so beautiful. Um, yeah. Now, you know, later pujas, they were it's always... It's the like, summer, you see, it's it's a, it's a light cotton sari. It's that's true. Seeming, yeah. It's beautiful, yes. Oh, yeah. amazing, amazing. <laughs> Look at mother's eyes, you know, yeah. there's softness. You can feel, you yeah. can feel in England that I haven't, you know, to every country has its own quality. And there's a quality of the softness of the heart in England. Yes. And we really felt that at this puja, you know, that we were in the heart of the of England. Look at mother's eyes, just so beautiful. Now that, is a, that is a longer photo because um, maybe you can scroll down yes there you go and there's I couldn't find this time but there's the photo of mother she's got her hands down and also there is yeah. in existence a long one with the feet as well and that's the shawl if you, scroll up, 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 if you scroll up to the top you can see this is the shawl that was embroidered with the little flowers and the creepers and yes. she's in it but it's just oh, mother's gaze just touches you deep in your heart amazing so somehow, and how beautifully the flowers just happen to match the colors of the sari and the um the, the butter that you, yes. uh, embroidered all of you i mean it's just so divine isn't it and the vibrations my my yeah mind. if you show that the last one of mother's feet um, the vibrations were just amazing. Oh, yes, look at that. So beautiful. Oh, wow. Yes. So at this point, Mother's feet are on the red one, I think, because of the kumkum. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the photos from Yedminster. And so I think after this, at, we must have, at some point, either this or the next day, this Shumadaji, they had organized that from... Dorset from Yetminster is the village, a mill farm Yetminster in Sherborne, near right. Sherborne, five miles from Sherborne. Um, she was then going on to Bristol and I think later Exeter as well. Um, mm. And we, uh, but we went into Sherborne and we went around the Abbey, you know, much Madhuji often did this when mm. she was visiting somewhere. She would like to go out and either do some shopping or just, um, you know, spread her vibrations around in yes. the air. And, yes. we, you know, we were very conscious that this was the first time Shramadaji had ever visited Dorset. Um, and yeah. this was, you know, so Dorset was, and she'd mentioned at another time that Dorset was a little bit left-sided, you know, Thomas Hardy's earlier novels really reflected that kind of left, <laughs> you know, left side yeah. melancholy. And yeah. you really felt a difference after she after we'd had this weekend you know that something had lifted you know she had cleared and so we went to Sherborne Abbey and we're yeah. standing 
inside, looking up at these incredible stone buttresses that, you know, archways that go up to support the roof. And Sumaraji made this sort of offhand comment, oh, I wonder how they made those, you know, and yeah. I I bought a guidebook because I thought it might be useful. And I started yeah. coming through it. Oh, maybe I'll find the answer. And without much delay, Mother then said, oh, well, actually, and proceeded to explain exactly how they had made the buttresses, you know. And I just went, wow. oh, of course, of course, Mother's the goddess. She knows everything. She's the <laughs> of all knowledge. And it was very sweet wow. because later... Um, it reminded me, uh, uh, Jamal mentioned that he'd had this whole conversation on, aer he, he worked in aeronautics and she explained all the aerodynamics of a plane and how it all worked, you know, and, and it was... She also visited St Albans um, Abbey, wasn't it? Because the, the bishop or someone was realised, that's the story? Oh, Jamel. I know. No, 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 no. That's a oh in um in where was he in St Albans? Maybe St Albans. Yeah. That's that's okay. the joke from then. Yeah. But right now we were in oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then so, uh, and then from there, I think from there we then took Shimadaji to the train station. So it was kind of a so she stayed overnight. She stayed. So she overnight. came on the Friday or Saturday. The, no, she came on okay. Sunday morning. We arrived, some of us arrived on Friday. All the yogis came down on Saturday morning. Um, Shumaraji came on the train on Saturday, on Sunday morning, and all the yogis, bar a few, um, who tried to get onto the train with her. Tell us story, please, without the names if you want. No, I won't give names. But she'd actually said um, yes. that we shouldn't try to travel with her unless they, we had been invited. You know, yeah. we shouldn't push ourselves forward that if you were meant to travel with Shumanaji, she would invite you. But two people had stayed behind, had not come down on Saturday with everyone else with the intention of of traveling on the same train as Shumanaji, you know, to be close because you all want to be closer to her, to have a little bit of her darshan, of her attention, her big smile. And she mentions in the, in the I think it's in this proof, she mentions that she played a trick on them and they missed the train, you know. So when she arrived, she said, yes, yes, you know, you're all here. And I'm sorry about that, but it was a bit too much. I had to play a trick on, <laughs> on them. So these, these two unfortunately missed the puja weekend. Um, so it was a lesson, you know, if mother says something don't disobey it you know just there's a reason because in our small minds we can't comprehend why you know it's as important so you just you just do it so from Sherba we went to we, so that's kind of a sweet story so so mother was no it wasn't from Sherba somehow it, but it was the next day I think we must have gone to Sherban Abbey on the Sunday afternoon. And then on the Monday, Shumaraji was traveling on towards Bristol. So I was invited to come in the car because supposedly I knew the directions to the station, which <laughs> I did, I did, but we got in the car. So you're in this very small, um, it was a small car. So there's the driver, Shramadaji's in the passenger seat in the front. There was myself and two other ladies, I think, who were traveling with Shramadaji to help uh, look after, I say look after her, but, you know, to help yeah. be there, carry her things for her. And um, so we're on our way and we arrive, we drive into the outskirts of Yeovil Station. And suddenly my mind is a complete blank. You know, I realize, I realize that I have no recollection of how to get to the station. And I'm just sitting, they said, enough Felicity, tell us the direction. And I'm just sitting there, you know, directly behind Shamadaji. And you just are so filled with the vibrations of being in the car with her. Um, and I was just totally thoughtless, you know. And um, so we're sitting there in silence. <laughs> <laughs> in the car as it's driving and um, I think at some point I must have said you know I'm so sorry my mind's gone a blank <laughs> and then after a short time Shumadaji herself started giving directions and then we arrived at the station you know I, I 
I mean, it was wonderful because, of course, she can do everything. But it was cool. such a f situation. Yeah. And and should I just add quickly that yes. this, so and not to go into any details, but at the seminar after the puja, um, there were marriages coming up the following weekend. And so matches were being arranged, uh, people were being suggested, Shumataji was making suggestions um, as to who, you know, who could be matched. It was very loose in those days. There was, I say loose because um, people were allowed a little bit more leeway that wasn't really as it should be. So there were a couple of couples who said, mother, we would like to get married. Um, and she said, yes. Uh, later on, she gave the talk about the importance of um, not matching yourselves. And very few, very few of the matches that did match themselves in those days survived, you know. And she explained to us the importance of um, having that a Sahaj arranged match is such a different yeah. um auspicious spiritual marriage that you match she matches people vibrationally um yes. and other little things but it's the vibrational match that's important because that's what's going to give you the balance in your spiritual growth through your life you know like we can all be attracted to different people for different things that we have in common etc but you need to have a very strong basis and if you are vibrationally matched like his strengths are your weaknesses, your strengths are his weaknesses. You can support each other, even if you don't understand each other at the beginning very much, you can support each other and you help keep each other balanced. A lot of the couples who match themselves had weaknesses on one side that they shared. And this kind of eventually just drove, um, drew them out of Sajoga. Not, not just that their match didn't work, but that they they left Sajoga. You know, you get caught in the mire. But anyway, we were on the station. So this is a so this is an example of how mother is in your head, you know. We're on the station and there's this lovely couple, Jim and Hillary, who come into Sajoga married and they were on the station too. There were only a few of us there. And suddenly this idea comes in my mind. Oh, Jim and Hillary, wouldn't it be nice if they had a Sahaj marriage, you know? And, and I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh, you know, ask mother, ask mother if you could have it. And then I realized, I thought, they'll never ask mother. You know, they're too humble. They would never ask. And so there's this conversation. And, and Shumanaji was very close to me physically. She was like six feet away, you know, like I could probably have reached out and touched her. And we're just standing waiting for the train to come in. And so inside my head is this conversation going on. And it's, and I hear this voice saying, ask mother, ask mother if they can get married. I'm going, no, I'm not going to ask mother. No, it's not my place to ask mother. I no way am I going to ask mother. You know? And it just wouldn't stop. It kept on. And I sort of looked at mother and I felt, oh, I think she wants me to ask for them, you know? And it was such a kind of connecting moment where they're there, I'm there, mother's there. And I just felt us all connected in this space. And so I braved up. And, you know, thought, well, if, if I'm I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I just said, oh, Shumadiji, what about if Jim and Hillary, you know, had a Sahaj marriage? And she went, yes, yes, of course, you know, like, like of course, of course, you know. And she sort of um, waved towards them. And it was so beautiful. But it was an interesting example of trying to be surrendered to, to what the divine wants you to do, to be an instrument, even when... You don't really want to be that instrument, you know. You don't want to put yourself for, forward. You don't, you know, don't want to put yourself in that place. But sometimes we have to be brave, and we may not feel comfortable. But is learning to recognize when you feel the divine is asking you to do something, to be an instrument for you. So that was kind of a sweet thing. So I let me speed up a little bit because we don't want it to be too long today. Um, so Shumaraji left on the train and I went back to the house to tidy up and clean up. And I was very concerned that I made everything look exactly like normal because my parents would come back and I didn't want there to be any trouble. My mother was a very scary person for me at that time. And I, a lot of things, quite a lot of things had got broken or 
damaged because there were that many people in the house. So, for example, the bed sheets, they had been massaging mother's feet with tiger balm, which was a, a thing that often, especially after puja, we couldn't always, we weren't clear enough in those days to always absorb the amount of vibrations that was generated when you do puja to Shumadaji and to the goddess and you are singing her praises, you are saying her names. Her being just starts filling with more and more vibrations um, in honor of this praise. But we as yogis have to be receptive enough that we can absorb these vibrations. And if we were not able, as was happened in those days, because we just didn't have that level of clearness in our chakras, you could only absorb so much, then these vibrations would fill up in mother's body. She would literally like swell up and it could be quite painful. So often she would invite, she would ask certain people to come and literally either massage her feet to rub out. So these were people who were maybe more clear, you know, who could yes. absorb more vibrations. And sometimes she would ask you to put your hand on a specific chakra and have the right hand out. So you could be a channel to just absorb these vibrations through you so that her being could um, could relax back to normal. And so at this, this particular weekend, they had been using tiger balm to massage mother's feet. And she liked you to massage hard. She would say harder, harder, you know, push harder. Um, that That's, I guess that's was getting the vibrations out. So the, there was yellow tiger balm all over the sheets. And there was, I think the toilet seat had got broken. There was the salt and pepper had got broken. So I went, I went out to town and I replaced everything. And I thought, you know, in my naivety, I, oh, they'll never notice. You know, I wasn't a householder then. So I didn't realize how when you're the luxury in the house, you know exactly what every single thing looks like in your house because you bought it, you know. And I thought they'll never notice. So I left and I went back up to London and they came home and they went down. And suddenly I got this phone call or the, from my mum saying, we'd like to speak to you. We heard that, the, that you had quite a big thing down here and you need to come down and talk to us. You know, my mum was very cross. And oh, I forgot to mention yeah, that. After, yeah, yeah. After Shumataji, this is the important part of the story. So after Shumataji yeah. left and I'm in the house cleaning and tidying up, I suddenly get this phone call from one of the yoginis who was traveling with Shumataji. And she said, Shumataji asked me to call you and to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Tell Felicity, thank you for the seminar. Thank you. And it was very effusive, you know, like she was sharing the effusiveness of this thank you. And I remember feeling, oh, why does mother have to thank me? You know, she does everything. Um, you know, you feel nice, you feel nice inside, but it felt like kind of superfluous. And then when I get this phone call from my mother and I thought, okay, this is why mother said thank you, because she wants me to know that I did the right thing, that I don't have to feel guilty that, you know, I'd always been the good girl. I'd never done anything against my parents or my parents' wishes. So it gave me some courage, some confidence. And I went down on the train um, to meet them. And all the way down on the train, I'm like, mother, what can I say? What am I going to say to them? How am I going to make this all you right? You must have been so nervous and petrified. I was. I was. I was. Trying I was. to be surrendered. Yes, I was. I was. I, at that point had not left England and gone to Canada and I had lot, not lost my fear of my mother. So, um, yes, so anyway, so I arrive and there they are and they call me in the living room and have me sitting down in front of them. And my mother had this list of all the things that I wow. replaced. And she <laughs> said, and she said to me, the neighbors told us, they said, our that Felicity had, you know, so many friends just crossing and crossing. So that's how they knew, because I thought, how did they know? You know, So the neighbors had, had ratted me out that all these people had come down. So I sat there, you know, and I, it was like just this beautiful miracle that mother suddenly put words in my mouth and I'm looking at them and I said, started to say, well, I'd asked you, you know, for a few friends. So I came down with a few friends 
and then and then other people heard about it and and it just sort of snowballed and they all arrived and then and then, and then I suddenly like this light bulb went on and I was looking at my mother and I said, and you know how generous you both are. And they are, they have, they are very generous materially as well. And I said, and you've always brought me up to be a generous person and gracious. And, and I just couldn't turn them away. And, and it just sort of snowballed like that. And they just melted. You know, it was like mother just gave me the right words to say everything. And I said, and I'm so sorry that things got broken and I, I replaced everything and I tried my best, but they just melted, you know, and I just went, oh, mother, see how she worked it all so beautifully. And that was it. It was finished and done. And and we had this lovely seminar and, and people later, you, you could see the change in the yogis. You know, by Sunday after the puja, everyone was just, mother was outside having a cup of tea in the garden. Everyone was laying on the grass and you could feel this depth of relaxation and clearness. And, you know, mother had said to us, when you relax fully and when you enjoy yourself, then the Kundalini comes up, the vibration that I can work through you, you know, and we all sort of went back to London on this, on this cloud, you know, it was just, it was a very special weekend. And somebody said to me recently, I was trying to remember who was there and, and ask them, you know, this was my recollection, what was yours? And someone said to me, that was the most normal I felt at a seminar, you know, it was just so, um, um, it was just so relaxing, you know. Absolutely. So it's really important for us to to organize. You know, we're very blessed here in, in England because we have this wonderful um, center in the countryside that Mother has blessed us with and the ability to stay overnight. And I really notice the difference when you go up on the Saturday before and you stay overnight and then you have the puja the next day. It gives you a chance to really clear out more of the daily stuff that we just absorb and we can then be yeah. in the puja better cleared to really absorb and see how important it is because when we absorb on this deep level it goes out into the atmosphere it goes out to other people all around us and we become better instruments so you know it's important to remember that puja is not just for us for our personal growth it's also for the growth of the country and of, you know, the humanity. And Shumadaji said at one point, she said, a puja in her presence is worth five years of meditation on our own. I just went, whoa, you know, because she can clear and touch you to such a deep level. And although she's not here physically anymore, when I've been to Cabela, you know, in these last years, I felt that same incredible depth of vibration that we felt in mother's presence at those seminars. So she's blessing us with her presence in these international seminars in the same way that we were blessed in her pres physical presence in those early days. So. Yes, that's a beautiful um, uh, recounting and recollection of Srimataji's uh, visit to Dorset and to the seminar. Now, just just as a sort of um, a, a word of advice, maybe from the wisdom of experience and being with Sri Mataji. So we had uh, Sri Adi Shakti Puja last year at Blossom Farm. And I think it's not for everyone possible to, it's not possible for everyone to go to Kabbalah or to India and go immerse themselves in vibrations and seminars. So, um, We've got one forthcoming um, in the Sahasrara Puja in the Scotland, I believe, this year for the UK yogis. How do you think the sort of the yogis, what should they do to benefit most? Because everyday life is just so kind of grueling in a way. Just you go. Know? Turn up, <laughs> you know, just turn up, be there. When we had Puja, we had the seminar um, about five or six years ago when we just arrived in Wales. And I remember feeling, you know, it's the, the 
blessing of the seminars is the opportunity to be together with your brothers and sisters, to be able to talk to them. You know, sometimes people say, oh no, it's the puja that's important. The socialization isn't so important, depending on what you talk about, you know, but, but and from my experience, just sharing with yogis, having an opportunity to hear about their lives, to, you know, someone is, is concerned about some challenge in their life, you give your perspective. It all helps us clear and grow deeper. And as you heard from Madhuji saying, she really liked, she really encouraged our connections to each other, our bonds to each other. You know, in those early years when I was 79, 80, 81, 82, it was all about um, creating this sense of family. And what does family do? Family visits each other, they talk to each other, they be with, they laugh, they enjoy, they share their sorrows together. And in when you go, when we just go to the public programs, it's so nice to see everyone and be together. Yeah. But you don't have that time to have that depth of connection. Yeah. So, you know, as she said, she said, I'm so happy that you organize these seminars to be together. And so all we have to do is just turn up and be there and she will take care of everything. She, she sends you, it. she sends people to talk to you that you need to talk to, that you need to learn yes. something from, or that, you know, you can share something with, um, you know, she's, she's there. She's there. When really? we get together collectively, mother is there. She's just, you know, what she yeah. does. That is true. Very true. Gosh. It is so, so important to just be together and to have that connection because we are part and parcel of the whole. Uh, of course, our individual connection with Trimatri is most important, but together, again, it's the collectivity, isn't it? That is so important as well to have that nucleus. If she said mechanism. that. If you're not a collective person, my attention goes away. I mean, obviously, yeah. some people are in situations where they can't yes. physically be collective, but you join yeah. online or you join things. But yeah. um, she's really stressed, you know. I remember one last little little instance, and she said it was very interesting, and I think it is applicable even to today. We were stay, we were living in this ashram, a Nightingale Lane ashram. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was there with my husband just after we were married. We it, they moved in from Warwick Road, and. There was a couple, so there were a lot of people living there. It was a, had been an old um, nursing home, and they right. turned into it was another of these co-op um, that was given to the Sajobis to live in for a while. And suddenly, I noticed that this young couple, um, the husband, had moved in with the boys in the, their dorm, and the and the wife was still in their room, and nobody really said in the thing or talked about it but I remember obviously we were all surprised and and yeah. um, you know when something happens in with a couple um it affects you know the ripples go out and it affects us collectively so you feel it inside yourself so at this point so I was waiting and so I think we must have been we were about to have a puja or mother was coming and I just thought so I didn't think about it. I didn't take any sides. Oh, this is, and the in, the implication was that there was a problem with the wife. That was right. And then what happened? And then I think, then I think the husband moved out away. I can't remember exactly the details, but mother came. And what she said was that, and, and it turned out, no, it turned out there was, a, a, although the husband was making it out that the problem was with the wife, when mother came, she made it clear in a very simple way that actually the problem was with the husband. And what she said to us was also, and this doesn't seem to be related to this, but I remember this at the time she said this clearly. Uh -huh. She said, when you feel that there is a problem with the collective, know that the problem is with you. And I yeah. thought, oh, wow, you know, you cannot blame the collectivity for your problems or this and that. And even to, you know, criticize the collective um, because the problem is with you because mother's attention is with the collective and she is. That's know, it. 
So, so I mean, in, in general, in general, having said that, I have seen things recently where, you know, and it, it is possible for collectives to go a bit off, but in general, you know, so always look to yourself first, always yeah. in if somebody says something, meditate on it to you. If they say something personal to you and meditate on it, mother, is this true? Do I have this problem? Should I be looking at this? Sometimes you do, and sometimes yeah. you don't. Sometimes it's the other person. But I feel like it's better to be honest. And, yeah. you know, a mother will tell us in the meditation when we ask in a detached way you have to so this is an interesting thing i'll just this links back last thing i promise um this links back to when we were in um Sherbon and in dorset and shamadaji was arranging marriages and i had had yeah. this experience in a diff i had visited a different collective and i was close to the brothers in that collective you know i've always been it's been always easy for me to have platonic relationships with brothers and sisters. I have a brother myself. Um, and one of the brothers suddenly said to me, knowing that marriages were coming up and being, being arranged, I don't know whether I should marry you or someone else, it's another sister. So I was completely shocked as far as I was concerned. You know, he was just like a brother to me. And I didn't know how to handle this. I didn't know what to do at all. So when we were in the car and we were traveling to the station and it, and I had wanted, I thought, I just want to give this to Shamadaji because I don't know what to do with this. And I didn't know if he was going to follow this through or, in a, or whatever. And we were in the car, um, marriages have been, matches have been made and things. And it went very silent in the car. And I suddenly felt, this is my opportunity. And I just said, sitting behind Shumataji quietly, Shumataji, so-and-so said, he didn't know, doesn't know whether to marry me or this other girl. And I was completely detached. I completely surrendered and gave this whole situation to Shumataji. I had no desire about it. So she was quiet for a while. I felt like she's probing to see where I am at with this. And then she just said, no, no, you should marry someone who you can talk to, you know? And I just felt such relief, <gasps> this is finished with, you know? Uh, but it was, it reinforced in my mind that, in my being that when you ask something of the divine, if you want an honest answer, yeah. you have to be detached. If you have a desire, you know, oh, you know, if I had thought, in my being, oh, I'd like really like to marry him. Mother might have said, okay, go on and do it, you know, because yeah. he allowed us to make our own mistakes. We had free will, but I wanted what was best for my spirit, you know, so so I wasn't going to do that. I, I just knew that mother knew best. So that's important, you know, and she said to us, be careful what you ask for, because the divine, <laughs> you know, it may not be the right thing for you. So mm -hmm. that's just a little bit of, you know, from my experience, you know, be detached, be honest and be brave, be prepared. Maybe it's not the answer, you know, but down the road, maybe it's not the answer you would like at the time, but down the road, you'll see why. And you'll go, oh, I get it now. Yes, there's sometimes there's no immediate answers uh, with divine because the divine works of at their own time and and their constructs are different from our limited understanding of things so it's really really great to to hear about this felicity G. thank you so much for sharing uh your beautiful memories with Shramataji. they're precious for all of us and uh, for all the yogis and others who've been watching everywhere thank you so much uh for your feedback and thank you so much it wouldn't be possible without these glorious times spent with shamatji i wanted to take a moment to show yes. so as i was um remember going to speak about this i found again these are 
these are the memory books. I think it's is. Are you seeing a reversed image as the words reverse? No, no, no. We, we see so the good. title: "Eternally yeah. Inspiring Recollections of Our Divine Mother." Yes. So this is book one. So this is the series. There's ten books in all that um, Linda Williams that everybody put together, and Shumadaji was really behind this project. And after the first editions came out, which were very thin, Shumadaji actually sat with someone and said why did the you know there's so many yogis who haven't contributed and she listed all these names of yogis who hadn't contributed to is that the hard bags that were there earlier the first uh, one uh, okay so yes well so you can see how thin they are so this is the first one this was done a little differently this was india chronologically and so then after that, then people, you know, gave the green light and people wrote in and contributed. And then Linda redid, you can see how thick, thick they are. Yeah. And they've got photos as well. And now they're done chronologically before they were done like England, India, Australia. And they make wonderful bedtime reading. And you really, oh, or, you, know, yeah. you the you really feel that you're there with mother you know if you enjoy these um audio yeah. these uh video podcasts of the memories there's just so many memories in there and particularly mm -hmm. in um this edition and the one that moves in the early memories of the australians are filled with a lot of practical advice shumadaji was giving us all very practical advice for our daily lives not just um, you know, diets, what to eat, you know, if you're left side or right side, how to clear this and that, how to, you know, bring your children up. And um, just, they're just wonderful, uh, not just a record, but a sort of source of knowledge for all of Absolutely. us. So they can be ordered, so they can be ordered through Amazon. And what I found was that you have to do a careful search because when I searched recently, um, a much more expensive version came up. They should only be about, you know, 12, 15 pounds each. So then I did some, I researched, researched again, and then I got right. original. I think some people are reselling at a higher price. I don't know. But anyway, they are available through Amazon. Um, so you've got volume one, volume two, and then it goes up to like volume 10. And um, I hope more people will take advantage of reading and enjoying the experiences that people have shared of with Shumataji, her most beautiful, amazing incarnation. Yes, yeah. that she graced us with her physical form that we could just, it's, she made, she has made it all so easy for us that, you know, we have her photographs, we have her lotus feet um, and everything. I mean, in the olden days, like St. Ganeshwar and all those other saints who have been there in the past, or Sri Jesus even, you know, things have been so hard for them. But we are so lucky that we have Shimataji with us and she's given us all, and you all the knowledge. You mentioned yeah. about um, Amruta Nirmala Vidya site with the recordings and when I went so mostly on YouTube they just have the edited version of the Open Your Heart talk from Mill Farm but if you go to the SoundCloud you've got the full 50 yeah. minutes 50 minutes talk no, um, Amruta so talk is better because you don't get the ads etc as you get on YouTube so yeah you have Shamataji's talks and you've got the full length and of also, it if you're a member of Amrita. And also sometimes attached to that puja event, there are other little talks. So there is an, uh -huh. an extra bit. Um, there's the music, which was really beautiful, um, that aren't, you know, that you can't search for. So it's I've started, I've actually started going through from 78, 79 and, and listening to all these other talks from other countries as well. So that was a vast source of knowledge for all of us to support our spiritual growth and maintain it thank you so much for having me Absolutely. thank you so much for joining us jay shamashi all our love take Jishma. care thank you